Today on ADG Pro, we're going back to an old favorite of mine, Magic Carpet, to try and figure out exactly what's going on with the mana system in the game. Now, okay, sure, mana in Magic Carpet is effectively your energy. You use it to cast spells, and the more you have, the more powerful the spells you can cast. Seems pretty straightforward. But one thing the game's bad at doing is not only telling you when you're even allowed to cast certain spells, but also how much mana is consumed to cast those spells, as well as how quickly you'll regenerate your spent mana. So we're going to do our best to figure this all out, and the initial hurdle we're going to run into is that, well, there's no numerical values for anything. All we get are little status gauges to see the health and mana status of our castles, balloons, and our wizard. But we do have one numerical value that we can take advantage of. If you go to the spell selection slash map screen and move your mouse cursor to the bottom, you'll see a grid appear showing the kill counts of each wizard in the game versus each other wizard. But more pertinently, this grid numerically shows us the current amount of mana each wizard has in their possession. Of course, if we're going to do any proper testing of the spells, we need the spells first. Now, there's a total of 24 spells in the game, and 50 levels, not counting the Hidden Worlds expansion. And as far as I'm aware, the earliest point where you can have all 24 spells on hand is partway through level 25. So, at first, I started chugging through the levels as fast as I could before it occurred to me that I might want to see if I have any leftover save files from prior videos or streams or whatever, which might help me out. And wouldn't you know it, I have a save file right at the start of level 26 with all of the spells. And it just so happens level 26 is a surprisingly good pick for doing this testing since it has no rival wizards and a very easy way to kill yourself for sake of losing mana. So here's the thing, since we only have one mana number to go by, we're gonna need a way to lose possessed mana to properly dial in which values are important. But once you've possessed any mana, there's only two ways to lose it, either by having a rival wizard possess a loose mana orb or settlement, or by dying while having loose mana orbs strewn about, as this will revert those mana orbs back to an unclaimed yellow form. Well, most of the time. I discovered during my testing here that sometimes when the player dies, their loose mana orbs do not revert back, and I couldn't figure out if there was any rhyme or reason to this. Just that if I kept getting myself killed over and over again, my possession over loose mana in the world would eventually be lost. The other trick is that we can't do this testing too far into the game, as beyond a certain level, the player starts beginning every level with a fixed set of spells, and so will not necessarily get all of the spells in every level. Not to mention, if you pick up a blue spell jar at this point, you get to cast the spell regardless of how much mana you have stored in your castle, as most spells typically require a certain amount of mana to be stashed away before you can cast them at all. So I began level 26, and my first goal was to set some baselines, the first of which being how much mana do we even need for each level of castle. Well, this is when the stumbling began, while I was trying to capture footage, because I was failing to take two very pertinent details into account, both of which have to do with how the game is tracking possessed mana. Basically, on the surface, it seems as though mana only really exists in one of two states. Either you've possessed it and it doesn't count towards stashed mana, but still counts towards the wizard mana gauge, or it counts as stashed mana as for the gauge for your castle. But in actuality, the game is tracking four different states of mana. Mana you've possessed, which is loose in the world or being carried on a balloon. Mana stashed in your castle. Mana stashed in any settlements you've possessed and a fixed 1,000 points of mana, which every wizard has, which cannot be stashed. This all led into some serious complications when trying to determine the mana values for everything. But thankfully, not complications I couldn't work around once I figured out what was going on. For instance, because your wizard has a fixed 1,000 points of mana on top of anything they possess, you sometimes become able to upgrade your castle before it completely fills up, as when it fills up completely, the castle's mana gauge will start flashing. Though this is more likely to happen early on rather than later due to the smaller mana values early in a level. In any case, this meant to figure out the mana required for each castle level, I had to go by when it became possible to cast the castle spell, not when the castle filled up completely. Which turned out to be 5,000 mana for the initial level 1 castle, doubling for each level following, thus 10,000 for level 2, 20,000 for level 3, 40,000 for level 4, 80,000 for level 5, 160,000 for level 6, and finally, 320,000 for a level 7 castle. Ah, but there's another trick to this too. Whenever you start a level, you have exactly enough mana to cast the castle spell, which is 5,000, yet 
your wizard details show you to only have 1000 mana, so what the heck's going on with that? Well, it turns out when you first start a level, your castle spell is intentionally set to only require 1000 mana to cast. But once you've built your first castle, the standard build costs are put into effect from that point forward for the remainder of the level. And this is why if you place your first castle right at the start of a level, decide you want to move it elsewhere, and try to do so before possessing any more mana, you'll be very short on having enough mana to build another. But next, we need to start getting access to our spells. Even without a castle built, we're able to cast 8 of our 24 spells. Fireball, Possession, Castle, Accelerate Forward, Accelerate Backward, Heal, Defend, and Beyond Sight. For the rest, we need to start stashing mana, and this led into another major stumbling point that I ran into. The only mana which counts towards which spells are unlocked is the mana stashed in your castle. Now you might be thinking, duh, but hold on a second here. Remember that at first glance, there's only two values seemingly being tracked in terms of mana. This is because any mana you get from possessed settlements visually counts towards the total mana stashed in your castle, but is not tracked internally as mana stashed in your castle. This difference is pertinent because the points at which you unlock spells only tracks for mana specifically stashed in the castle, meaning if you possess 20,000 mana worth of settlements and got up to a level 3 castle without having to kill a single monster, then sure, you've got yourself your level 3 castle. But none of the spells you would acquire from stashing that much mana in your castle would have been unlocked. So yeah, even though the settlements on level 26 would have been a nice way to portion out tiny amounts of mana when needed, none of it counts towards unlocking spells. Plus, once you've claimed a settlement, you can no longer intentionally cause damage to it. So the only way I was going to ensure I didn't screw myself over in this regard was mass genocide. Yeah, once I'd gotten powerful enough to take out entire fields of entities, I basically wiped the entire civilian population from this map to be absolutely certain that I didn't accidentally possess any settlements at this point. There's two other things to keep in mind as we try to discern how much stashed mana unlocks the remaining 16 spells. Firstly, since most monsters release hundreds or thousands of mana when defeated, and since we only have one number we can track to figure out how much mana is stashed in our castle, I opted to go only by multiples of 2500 mana at first, then eventually multiples of 5000 once the spells started getting much further spaced apart. Now if I crossed the threshold too far, I'd simply head for the mountain ring on this map, as this entire ring of mountains is full of detonation triggers, which can be triggered an unlimited number of times, thus making for an easy way to get blasted out of the sky to reset any loose mana hanging around. Not to mention leveling my castle down and selectively repossessing mana orbs once I was revived to try and get back on track. The other thing to keep in mind is, again, there's a fixed 1000 points of mana that our wizard has, so the actual thresholds I want to track are 1000 points higher, as the amount of mana stored in my castle once the balloons stop doing their thing should equal exactly the number on this screen here, minus 1000. Anyways, the first of the remaining spells to unlock was Rebound, at around 7500 mana, then both Teleport and Mana Magnet at 10,000 mana. Yes, my possessed mana is way higher than 10,000 here, but I've only got a level 1 castle in place, meaning it can only stash 10,000 mana at most, so I'm taking that into account. Though realistically, you're going to level up your castle ASAP, thus why I'm indicating that the minimum castle size for those spells is level 2. Next up is Wall of Fire at 12,500 mana, then both dual and steel mana at 20,000, followed by Lightning Bolt at 25,000 mana, and both Invisibility and Rapid Fireball at 50,000 mana. Which, I still find it odd that you get Rapid Fireball after Lightning Bolt, given that Lightning Bolt is generally so much better, even if it is heavy on the mana usage. Now we start getting into the really powerful spells, with Lightning Storm being unlocked at 90,000 mana, both Crater and Meteor being unlocked at 100,000 mana, Earthquake at 120,000 mana, Undead Army at 150,000 mana, Volcano at 180,000 mana, and finally, Global Death at 200,000 mana. So yeah, now we know exactly what each spell unlocks, keeping in mind that this only counts mana stashed away in your castle. So if there's a lot of friendly settlements on the map and you decide to possess them, this can end up skewing those numbers. But there's a couple of other interesting things I wanted to look into too. The first being how much mana it costs to cast these various spells. 
Now, I'm not going to track the casting cost of the rapid fire spells, specifically rapid fireball and lightning bolt, because those spells literally fire off a shot every single frame of gameplay. And since the speed of the game is tied to the frame rate, there'd be little use in the proper numbers for that. Not to mention, by the time rapid fireball unlocks, you have so many casts of it that you can't even count them correctly. As the gauge which shows you how many casts you have available can only show 54 casts of a spell in total, represented as single bright pixels, with the darker grey bar appearing behind them being the fraction of mana you have available towards one more cast. In any case, by carefully noting the amount of mana possessed along with casting counts and fractional states, I was able to come up with the following table of casting costs for all the spells. For the most part, the casting costs of the spells sort of make sense, but some of them do feel a bit off. For instance, Rebound is only half the cost of Defend, but is often much more tactically useful. Granted, its effect also wears off a lot quicker. Earthquake is half the cost of Crater, which doesn't surprise me given that Crater is a lot more reliable, while Earthquake is much more random. Lightning Storm I feel may be a bit too expensive given that it too has some level of randomness, though at the same time, letting loose Lightning Storms and rival castles can be extremely effective. Wall of Fire I feel is definitely too expensive given the amount of damage it does, though on the flip side, unlike Fireball and Meteor, it is unaffected by rebounding. A Teleport I feel is actually too cheap given what it does, and I think it should have been pegged closer to 10,000 per cast. And the same with Undead Army, which I feel should have been closer in cost to Lightning Storm, up around 20,000 give or take a little. A heal may also seem cheap, but remember that it's a thousand mana per unit of healing, which if you're low on health could end up being cast over 16 times in a row, thus burning 16,000 mana or more. And lastly, I wanted to take a closer look at mana regeneration. Now normally, when you're over top of your castle or special monuments, your health and mana rapidly regenerate to maximum over the course of just a few seconds. But you also have natural regeneration, which happens the rest of the time and I was curious about this natural rate. However, the trick here is that I needed to first find out what state the regen rate was linked to, as I knew it would fluctuate over the course of a level, but I wasn't 100% certain what was affecting it. Well, it turns out the only thing the mana regen rate is affected by is the amount of mana presently in the world. The more mana in the world, the faster your mana regenerates, plain and simple. I guess this kind of makes sense, but it also means that there's an incentive to triggering certain enemy spawns early, as doing so will bump up the amount of mana in the world and thus subsequently the rate at which your mana regenerates. In any case, I investigated the rate of regeneration at various quantities of mana in the world with various quantities of mana possessed, and found out that you regenerate roughly 1 64th of your mana for about every 50 frames of gameplay on average. Whatever math is going on in the background is not super exact about this, and thus it does fluctuate a little. This means if you have exactly one quarter of the mana in the world, and that happens to be 40,000 mana, it would take about 800 frames of gameplay to regenerate it naturally, and you'd be regenerating 50 mana per frame. So about one cast of possession per frame. Now how fast those 800 frames go really depends on your hardware or emulation settings, given that the speed of the game is very inconsistent. But during intense action, those frames are naturally going to go a lot slower compared to if nothing's going on. And yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to look into. Magic Carpet's mana system definitely has some weirdness going on under the hood, but now that I understand its nuances, it helps to explain many of the inconsistencies I witnessed while playing this game as a kid. In any case, I've put together a quick reference page, which details all the mana findings for the spells, which you'll find a link for in the video description, should you want to print yourself out a copy. Anywho, that'll be all for today's episode of ADG Pro. Next up, two Saturdays from now on June 4th, we're finally doing it. Episode number 300. My original plans for this episode fell through, so I had to put some thought into what else would serve as a worthy thing to end Season 6 of ADG, and I ultimately decided to cover a title which is widely considered to be a game changer for the industry, as it helped to define what was possible with fully realized 3D environments. And yes, this is a DOS game, a fact often forgotten given that it originally came out in the mid-90s and was more widely recognized on consoles than on the PC. So be sure to stay tuned to see which game it was which turned heads in more ways than one. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small selection of you guys.